using material after the initial build and use them to uh, debug the software. Um, one of the things that, that uh, we want for Debian is that actually we want to be sure that we can build packages from source. Uh, that's mandatory. And so if we, uh, if we say that packages need, need to be reproducible, uh, to have reproducible builds, then we can make sure that actually that, that is uh, uh, happening. Uh, multi hack same has to be uh, exactly the same packages. Uh, across, uh, uh, um, no, they, sorry, they, multi hack same packages, if they contain files with the same name, they have to be bitwise identical. So also, while making a package uh, build system deterministic, we help the multi arc uh, crowd or vice versa. Uh, there's also the idea that if you, from one version to another, of a software, if the build system is deterministic, maybe the .deb will not have changed that much. And so between one version to another, then uh, the, it might be pretty similar and we might get smaller deltas and faster upgrades and you know, less bandwidth, less, less disk space. Uh, another users of uh, deterministic build will be um, the build profiles mechanism that it's getting in. Um, and so the build profile is an idea, like it's, it's helpful for bootstrapping uh, new architectures. That's, that's one of the uh, underlying reasons. And the idea with build profile is that if a profile A builds a couple of packages, like some packages, and if a build profile B builds a subset of these packages, the subsets need to be also identical in feature to the other build profile. And so with reproducible build, then we can make sure that they're actually feature-wise identical because they would be bit-wise identical. Uh, and maybe we can find other reasons. I don't know. There's many uh, interesting uh, aspects. So how did it start for me? So I'm active in the Tor project. Uh, and during um, uh, past year uh, spring, Mike Perry and other people working on the Tor browser uh, work on making, uh, on making the Tor browser build process deterministic. Um, for the one of, of the very reason I explained before. Um, that process was partly inspired also by the Bitcoin crowd because they are shipping binary that handle valuable assets of people and so they wanted to be sure like when they had a hand out a binary to uh, someone that, that someone says, yeah, you're not stealing my money or whatever this cryptocurrency thing is. Um, and so, but it's not, so we have that for the, the, the Tor Brother and it's been very uh, interesting in, in how it, it changes some of the development process, processes. So for example, once someone in the team tag a build, then other people in the team will also start running the build, but there's only one person who will actually upload the gigabyte of multiple versions of package to the server, everybody else will only upload a single sign signature of the shaysum file, of the checksums on the various. And, and so you can actually uh, have one system with a very, you know, uh, that you do not trust that much, but with a very fast internet connection, uploading data to a server somewhere. And, uh, and then on your own laptop, you redo the build and you have a sheet like you're on a train, whatever. Once the build is finished, you only have to compare the checksums. And if the checksum match, you know that it's okay. And you, if multiple people do the same process and you have far more trust, then there have been no compromise in the process because, well, we all got the same results and it's highly unlikely that oh, everybody, everybody got compromised at once. But this is, this is not a, a new idea. Uh, so someone once, after starting the process uh, last year, someone, uh, Martin Uecker, wrote, wrote to, uh, to me and pointed me at that email from 2007, so that's seven years ago, uh, on Debian Devel saying, yeah, I think it would be really cool if Debian policy required that packages could be rebuilt identical from source. At the moment, it's impossible to independently verify the integrity of binary packages. Well, that was seven years ago. Uh, 
the reaction were not super enthusiastic. Also, probably because Martin was not part of the, you know, established Debian crowd. But so, for example, like Neil Williams, who's in the room, no, uh, said, "Why? Well, I've seen a benefit. Well, I hope you will see benefits." And uh, Manosh, uh, who's also not in the room, but still, said, "Well, I think this this is technically infeasible, but hey, I'll be happy to be proved wrong." So I, I would be, let's prove him wrong. Uh, so what happened is, is so, uh, the, after the, the example of uh, the Tor brother, uh, I scheduled a really last minute buff uh, during DevCon 14 in Switzerland. And I was very surprised because there were like 30 people showed up. And we had an interesting hour-long discussion, well, 45 minutes discussion, which was short, but still. And uh, that kicked off the wiki page reproducible build. Um, and so, well, the, the, the wiki page tries to uh, gather many information, it's a long page. If you want to help make it better, please do. But uh, mainly, um, how do you do reproducible build? What are, what are the steps that uh, we need to do that? So. It's pretty simple, actually. One is, you record the build environment, so you know what tools you used to build a specific package. Um, you, and then when you want to, to, you need a way to reproduce that build environment. So when you want to reproduce the build, you start by setting up the same envi in environment that was the initial environment. And then you need to eliminate all the unneeded variations that are part of the build process. And uh, so recording is actually fairly simple for Debian. Uh, it's, you know, we have packages, we have, they have versions. So if we install the very same versions of the packages that were installed, where we are very likely to be in the same build environment. Uh, reproducing the build environment is also fairly easy for Debian because we have snapshot. And, uh, and Snapshot saves every binary version of every package that I've entered the archive. And so you can actually take packages from there and you get a very, uh, an environment that is very close to the initial environment. Then there is all these variations uh, and that are like captured by the build systems where maybe they're not, you know, they're not need to be captured for getting a final software. So timestamps. Everywhere, timestamps. Um, so, like, you know, uh, you create a file, and then it's the time where of its creation is recorded. That's what DPTG does, for example. Um, so, let me tell you, I I'm willing to uh, lead collective um, timestamp fan anonymous sessions or whatever, like a support group if you want. <laughs> Timestamps in a build process are not a useful information to capture. I, please trust me. What is interesting is, for example, the, you know, what source you have used, the environment that you've used, like the, the, the timestamp maybe of the last git commit, but the timestamp of the build, no. If, if I take an old version and I build it now, you're, you're not, there's, no, you know, there's no interest in capturing that information, really. Uh, maybe as a metadata, but it's not, not as part of the software. Support group, I can, I can do support group. Um, the other piece of, of information that, that gets captured uh, is build paths, and that's really annoying. Um, it's, it's you know where where you actually type the make command gets into the final binary. Nah. Uh, file order might get captured uh, if you concatenate. You know you do concat e, star star something and then depending on when they were written in the file system, you get different results in the final build. Uh, I don't know. Do you we can yeah. Uh, it's worth noting on build paths that those are a security hole occasionally as well. Uh, the, <coughs> excuse me, 
uh, occasionally we find that people's uh, paths in developers' home directories yeah, now it's working. Okay. Uh, occasionally we find that paths in developers home directories are hard coded into packages and that the package, uh, package will care whether that thing under slash home exists. So that's yeah. worth nuking for other reasons. Yes. Um, so for example, you have uh, Russ, you want to add something? Okay. One one comment on the timestamps, the one place where I do know that that is used is it's used by GDB when you're actually debugging a binary so that it can tell you that the source file is newer than whatever went into the binary. Um, I suspect there's some easier way of storing, or some better way of storing that timestamp than the build timestamp, but it is used there, I think. I'm coming to the build, like I'm, I'm coming to the debug symbols. That's okay. major headache. Um, and so local, for example, get, get, get also captured uh, for example, the you know, GNU sort command line utility will sort file differently depending on your local. Yep. Uh, so, for example, so gzip, to give you a couple of examples, gzip by default will start a timestamp. Yay, super useful information. Um, AR, tar, zip, jar, they all start timestamp. Uh, so, and, and for Debian, it, I mean, most of them will start a timestamp that is pretty useless because this is the time of the build. It is, you just like, you've, you've given, you've created, you've just created a new file with GCC and put them in, in an archive and so that timestamp is not really interesting. Uh, Javadoc writes timestamp in the held file. Why? <laughs> um, so that's, that's the major headache. So, um, Dwarf, so you have elf, you know, and you have the, the, the dwarf, uh, which are debug, debug symbols. And so in, uh, in dwarf, there's the, um, the build path of the source code gets uh, captured, which actually is annoying because then it means that if you install the dash dbg package in Debian, uh, then the source path is not right. You can't, you know, you have to, to fiddle with it. I, I'm coming back to that later. Go for it. So we currently do builds inside of fake root. Perhaps we should start doing builds inside fake time or similar and like always return the app. I'm coming to that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so for file order, we have read here which returns file in the order of the file system. Uh, so I mean, yeah. Uh, for local, so that's, that's why I, I told you like sort varies between uh, um, French and the C, like if you have an accented letter, but there's always, there's also other examples. Uh, other information that might get captured, the host name of the system, super useful in a built binary, told you. The uh, uname output, well, for some cases, but really, I'm not sure. The username of the builder, no. Uh, so we could cheat, that's the way the top browser does it. Uh, they use a VM, uh, like the, that's the Gitian thing, the, the, the Bitcoin people also use that. They use a VM. So, and everybody who's building the thing gets the same uh, virtual machine image. And so they have the same kernel, they have the same user, they have the same build path because it's basically the same file they share. Uh, and for example, they also use tools like libfectime, which fakes the time. Uh, but so, so that's one way to do it. Uh, the other way to do it is, and I think is more correct for Debian, uh, because it's not, you know, we, we do not craft our little solutions in, in our corner, but it also would be great if every uh, free software distribution would, be, uh, would have reproducible builds. So we fix the bugs, which I consider that in the build process, capture some data that is not useful for the resulting software, then it's, it's, it's a bug in the build system. So for example, we can configure the, the tool chain. Uh, Binitils has a, an option that is called, when you, when you do the, the, the dot flash configure, enable deterministic archives, which will actually have the AR command, not record uh, user ID and timestamps. Uh, so that would make it the default. Um, we need to patch software like Javadoc, so they get a minus minus no timestamps. 
and we could eventually like we need we can individually individually patch build systems like uh, changing the build system so gzip has the minus n option which will not capture the, the name of the file in the timestamp uh, Paul so uh, just looking at this stuff it makes me think of upstreams and that makes me think of the upstream guide and the boff that's coming up later in the week and yeah so we could add some advice for upstreams and and maybe do you think the proper place to do this is fix the build systems themselves like autoconf cmake or is it problems in the separate um, config well, configuration for those so for example binitial is tool chain so it's it's our responsibility uh, gzip is often called when in, in the Debian roles when we uh, do the main page thing. So what about Javadoc? I was thinking mostly of that one. Well, we could try to make Javadoc by default not store timestamp at all, but that's True. the fight with the with, with the Javadoc upstream. Yeah. Right. That, that's the fight we should do. But also, there's something that more and more upstream are getting interesting into being deterministic their build system. Like I know that it's not it's not much, but the HTTPS everywhere extension. Uh, for Firefox is the, the build is, is reproducible but it's pretty useless for Debian because the Debian package itself cannot be reproducible. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in order to like toy with these ideas and you know think of, thinking about also what Manage uh, said, uh, we, what we did is, is an experiment. Uh, building by building and rebuilding many sources pack many source packages, uh, we used uh, so the uh, EC2 VM VM things. I'm not I'm not clear on the details, but uh, David Suarez uh, made all the magic happen, uh, and and thanks uh, to him a lot. And so uh, the idea of the experiment is we build the package twice. Uh, and to do so, we set up a clean route, we unpack the source code, we install the build depends, we build, and then we do the exact same thing. Uh, one slight difference is that we pass the timestamp of the post build to the PKG through an environment, uh, un environment variable. Uh, there's, so in that context of the experiment, we make two variations, uh, the time, of the build is different because there's no lead tech time library or such. Uh, and the build path will be different because the build is done with sbuild, which will pick a random path every time you have a build. But there's no changes, no variations in hostname or username or uname or I believe the file order because we unpack the, the package uh, the same way both times or the local, which is I think C in both cases. But still, it is, it is a, a pretty good uh, framework to, to start evaluating. Um, and so for the uh, second experiment we made in January, uh, so the changes from a normal Debian build environment system that we did was, so there's a patch for GPKG that uses a single timestamp for the whole archive. So the .deb, you know, .deb are made of tar files. And so the tar files have a single timestamp. Uh, and we can pass to dpkg uh, an environment variable that will make it write the exact timestamp in the uh, timestamp in the archive. Uh, there's also sorting of the files uh, that dpkg put in the archive, so we we'll always get the same file order. Um, and so to 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 get to fix the build path problem in the dwarf files. We uh, used the tool that was designed by uh, Red Hat called uh, Debug Edit, and we can change the paths in the, the written TWAF files after the build. And so we, we used to, we hooked that into a dev helper strip, DH strip, uh, which also produces most of the dash DBG package. So that, that felt like a good place to place it. But, there's a trick that we need to pass the um, minus f no merge debug strings to GCC because otherwise debug edit can't work well because hash table order will get dumped, blah, details, painful, blah. Um, and also binotials has been rebuilt to have the enable deterministic archives. So that's, that's the experiment we did. Uh, we built 
5,151 source packages, and that produced three, four, four, so for 3,196 of them, we had produced identical binary packages. That's 62%. Uh, is there a rationale for the set of uh, for the set of source packages you chose? Because you know, I went to look at it to see what the state of mind was, and almost none of them were there. No, they were picked at random by right. David Systems. Uh, so it is not actually like super representative, but it is to say that it's not a crazy idea. We can do this, and and maybe getting to a hundred percent is a crazy idea, or will take several decades. I don't know. Uh, but at least getting to, uh, I don't know, 80, 90 percent uh, doesn't sound like an like, like unreachable goal. Um, to, to give you a couple examples, with that setup, find the chills was uh, reproducible, wget, calypsy, busybox, uh, Python support. So that, that's a couple of packages that they were uh, working well. Uh, for the failures that we identified in the, the resulting, the remaining packages, there were a top, top failure is uh, the dwarf file still having a mismatching build ID. Uh, so, the, so between the two builds, which probably is because the build path, so either the package is not calling the H trip or the build path is encoded in a way that the trick we used didn't work. Yeah. Uh, so JAR files, there were there was a problem in Haskell files. There was a problem in a PHP registry capturing build path. Uh, GZ timestamps, uh, Mono. That's there's something with Mono going on. I haven't, I don't know. Uh, there was a dog book to man, like a timestamp in there. Uh, so that couple of also of other like, like um, hanging fruit, like low hanging, low hanging fruits that you know could benefit a lot of packages at once. Uh, but right now we still have no good solution for the, the build ID thing, the, the, the dwarf. Uh, so one idea that actually Stefan Glondu came up on the reproducible main list is, okay, uh, let's, let's stop creating DHtrip weird things. Let's, how about we agree on a canonical build path? Um, that will solve uh, the problem Colin mentioned about random paths getting in the files. Uh, and also we would have GDB, uh, would have a canonical location, so it would be easier for Debian users to just have to get source in the right location and uh, when they will like, run GDB, they, they will have the right path already uh, set up for them. And there's a tool that is called Pirut uh, that can actually fake the current um, directory of a software. Uh, so you could eventually like build the software in whatever directory you want, run dpkg build package, and it will actually, in the background, like fake root does, fake the current directory so you get the canonical one. But we will change, like, I don't know, the S build and P builder so they will use this canonical repository every time. Um, P root has downsides in that it uses ptrace, so it's not available on all architectures, so that might be a problem, I don't know. But, uh, and it's unclear how we push uh, changes like that, you know, uh, it, or at least to me, if, if they're like super old timers of Debian who tell me like how we get to decide on the canonical build path, please don't answer me, do a GR, but uh, <laughs> That, that, that would be an idea to solve that, that particular class of problem all at once. Um, one other idea might be contentious would be to uh, have dpkg build package uh, export uh, the environment viable gzip, which are options for gzip, and pass the minus n option by default. Uh, maintainers were not really happy when, when dpkg build package started to push C flags and all, so maybe this is contagious, but it would solve a lot, also a lot of packages at once, so I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, it seems like that would run, fall afoul of a number of upstream build systems that go out of their way to not be affected by environment variables like gzip that you may have set as a user. Mm -hmm. Well, then, then you can fix them individually, but we can, we can swipe a lot of apples. Uh, I won't see if we, if, we, if we did that. That's, I don't know. Uh, Russ, had a question? Sorry. Or comment? Hey, I'll get fit. <laughs> Is it possible to strip the timestamps out of gzip compressed files even if they were originally compressed without dash n uh, as a post-processing step? Because if so, you could just throw something in the deb helper that goes through all the compressed files in the package and just removes the timestamps. Uh, good idea. I, I, I don't know if that's such a tool, but that, that, uh, that might be easy to write, actually. They're easy to strip out, so yes, we should do that. Mm. Okay. Huh. Interesting. Um, uh, I had an answer for the default build path that was not a GR. Um, so user SRCs should be read-only according to different policies I could read. And uh, pbuilder uh, throws stuff in var cache, so maybe that could be used instead. And I had a question regarding uh, that, the timestamp. When you fake a timestamp, which, which time do you choose? So you... you <laughs> So, so what it is, so you, if you do a first build and you capture the build environment, you capture the time of that build environment, and that's what we use to, uh, to, to like as a reproduced, reproduced uh, point on, on uh, when we did um, uh, write the dot deb of the second build. But the no, well, the time, whatever. It's it's using the same. It's using the time at the start of the build right now. But uh, the point is, I mean, libfact time has become really powerful. You can actually record all calls to get timestamp of the day, and have it replay them. But I don't think that's the way we should do it in Debian. I mean, we could also agree that we we why it is it done that way? Is actually to please Gillen. Yover from GPKG because the initial discussions were I want to keep timestamps. That's what he said. So uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe we have to go to the technical committee to say okay, it's not useful to have a timestamp in the .deb archives at all. Um, yeah. So I, I'd like to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Question on that. So that's good enough for the use case of us testing that packages are reproducible. But I think the other use case is enabling user to re reproduce mm -hmm. the exact package which are in the same archive to ensure that we are not making anything fishy. So how do you imagine that? We produce the packages, and there is a way to extract the packages for the user to apply. So my my replay. Sorry. So I have a couple of, of crazy ideas, but uh, uh, can I can I like I sure. go back? Okay. Cool. Um, so just to finish, I wanted to make a new experiment using DPKG uh, build package that would call pruse. Uh, but David Suarez was too busy, so I couldn't. I'm really sorry. I would have expected something like 80 percent, but uh, but I don't know. Maybe 90 percent. I don't know. Um, there's other distribution interesting to that. Uh, so there's Fedora, who's uh, um, had like one of the security uh, people walk, writing a blog post about, about this after we started the Debian initiative. To the best of my knowledge, uh, there has been no further progress in that. Uh, OpenSUSE has something interesting called build compare, but I hadn't like time to look a lot about it. And um, the distro called NextOS is super interested into reproducible builds because they, they have an interesting system where they capture the um, they already captured the environment that were that was used uh, to build a specific package as a and its dependencies, um, and so if they got reproducible build, then that mean it means that when you upgrade a specific package, you have to rebuild far less, because if a dependent if a build dependency hasn't cha like changed but hasn't changed its behavior then the checksum at the end keeps, uh, stays the same. Uh, so that, they were like interesting cross uh, collaboration, but it's so far, I'm, I'm under the impression that the main efforts on this have been like in, in the Debian crowd or uh, friends. 
Um, so, okay, before I get to want to help, um, crazy ideas. Um, so one thing, first, there's this, this, um, this idea that we should not directly pick packet dead binary packages that are well built on developer system and put them in the archive. Uh, we're getting there slowly, like Ensgar worked on, on DAC uh, to uh, move forward on this. What I'm advocating is actually we make so developers are forced to build binaries. So then we add the dot deb, and so the dot changes file contain a checksum for the dot deb, right? And you upload everything to the upload queue except the dot deb. And then you have a build D that would pick that changes and all the afferent file, <coughs> rebuild the packages from source in the same environment. And if the dot deb actually that has been produced matched the original checksum, then it gets in the archive. That idea. So that means sparing all uh, internet connections, which would be good. But also, uh, it, it, it means that then you have reasonable trust that uh, your system is not compromised, or the build is not com uh, um, at the same time as the build is compromised. That's, but uh, yeah. Of course, you do have a problem with multi-arch and different architectures with that, because most of your developers will only have one architecture to play with, or two. So you only got faith that the architecture that your developer has uploaded for hasn't been compromised and not a sub-architecture. Yeah, sure, but you, we can, I mean, we have general trust that the buildy are not easy, easy systems to compromise, or we try our best, so it's not the case. We can also have multiple buildies in multiple geographical locations um, and cross those. One here. In addition to just having multiple build Ds, you could also have the standard build D system work as is now and then other people who want to run reproduce build Ds can still pull the same things from Snapshot and attempt to reproduce these and then verify that for themselves. Right. So my main, my main focus, like to answer Zach's question, my, make, my, make, uh, my main focus is the dot changes file. I want dot changes to be the basis of reproducing a given build. Uh, then we could even go more crazy is that currently changes file are signed by only one developer. We could have dot changes file that are, that are signed by multiple keys. So we can trust even more, like, like you know, spread the trust to uh, have more trust. So that's, that's an idea. Uh, so if you want to help, uh, that's that one of the things that I really would like to make this experiment that I hadn't had the time. Uh, as every large scale build experiment, what takes time is also to sort the results. So if you want to help, we have a nice tool that is called DFP that takes two dot changes file and we are like run a lot of crazy tool and tell you differences by diffing many file formats inside the dot dev. Um, so that's that is people like triaging bug that's that's one thing yeah Paul just, <coughs> just quickly on the uh, the changes and the multiple signers um, that makes me think you need detached signatures f from the changes file um, uh, you don't actually you can have uh, multiple signatures in the same block so you then modify the changes file when someone else signs it Bike shading. Let's let's go on. We we can find solution. That's um, currently we have no. So my point is we need to put every single piece of information that's useful to reproduce a build in the dot changes file. Maybe that's not the best way to do it. So there's research to be done there. Uh, so that's that's one thing. And and we need someone that would specify something. 
So uh, we could record information and then replay it later, but that effectively means that if you build in the absence of that build log information, you get a different build. Mm -hmm. I think it would be more valuable if we construct a standard environment so that if two completely independent builds occur, they will get the same result without any logged information that needs replaying. And that doesn't seem infeasible for most of the problems that you've mentioned. Yeah, that, that's so 10 minutes left. That's trade-offs here that might not be super easy. Uh. Uh, any, any such standard environment would be constantly evolving because your build dependencies are constantly moving under you. But there are, th there are various uh, tools that exist today. Um, DH build info, I think, yeah, is, is one, one such one that, uh, that, that do log this kind of thing. And maybe we should just uh, uh, standardize in one of those. Yep. <laughs> Um, so not sure if the, not sure if this is going to derail your talk. So I'm sorry. Um, uh, have you guys seen anything where it builds multiple versions of the same binary and then tests to see what, which one performs best and then ends up using that one? I seem to remember there was something with Firefox maybe that did that. Um, what is it? PGO. PGO. Oh yeah, right. Exactly. Um, have you seen that? And are there techniques to avoid that? No, not yet. Um, well, I know that Firefox can be made reproducible because the Tor browser is based on Firefox, and so it's it's. There has been the need to stomp random bytes, free bytes that are like zeroed because nobody could get a clue where they, where you know why they were written to the binary at some point, but it's doable. Um, so if you want to help specify, that's there's a that's worked here, uh, and we need that as well. Uh, if you want to code then there's a lot of no timestamps option that needs to be added to, program, to software. Or if you want to do politics, you can also, once that code is written, try to convince that it should be the default option. Um, and also, we are still missing a script that would like, uh, you give it a changes file, and maybe a recon environment from in the changes file or in other file, I don't know, maybe in the DH build info file. Uh, and it would like fetch the correct dependencies version from snapshot, Set up that in uh, pbuilder or icebuild truth and run the build. That would be an awesome thing to do. It's, we know it's doable, no one just got to it yet. It's probably that weekend project. Um, and there's, there's, there's project management to be done here. There's a lot of baby steps uh, that to move forward to the goal of reproducible build. I would love someone that is not completely full with so many things to just, you know, ask me once in a while, I'll ask anyone interested in, hey, what are you going to do about reproducible build this week? And I can tell them, yeah, I, I will look at this package. <laughs> and maybe I will not, but at least I will like some, some I don't know, some, some kind of peer pressure, just like, okay, what, what is, you know, what is we need to do next? Uh, I mean, during the last hack, session, uh, hack, <coughs> hack time, Ashish just told me, like, you know, do something about reproducible build, and I, I sent a patch to DH Python that took me half an hour to write. So this is a lot of, you know, small, small things that can be done. Um, if you want to stay in touch with the project, so there's the reproducible builds wiki page, subscribe to it, and there's also a main list. And that main list is used by the, as a user tag in the Debian BTS to record every bugs we've, we've, uh, we've reported so far uh, as part of the project and we had very good reactions from a lot of maintainers uh, who promptly you know, took the patch and that added like a minus n to gzip or added sort, sorting five things to get a cyber stable order. So uh, yeah, there will be a buff. So that's why I was cutting some of the questions. There will be a buff right after dinner to discuss technical solutions, so we have 45 minutes more to try to, you know, sort out the fog and make plans so we can get to total world domination. Um, no, so we get to a reproducible build. So yeah, that's that's my end of, of what I had to uh, present so far. I want to give credits to, uh, yeah, so, so Stefan Gondu has a lot of work at some point, he's not here, uh, and David Suarez, and a couple of other people who, uh, who actually uh, really got interested in the deep thing, uh, uh, and not just like tell me, yeah, this is great. So, and, and please, I mean, this is not something that uh, I or even like two people will fix alone, and you know, this, this is an issue for the whole 
Debian and free software community, even as a larger group. So let, let's, you know, let's do that. Just on that, maybe we can expose these. Just maybe we can expose these problems to the developer community as a whole via the package tracking system. Um, the new tracker is relatively easy to contribute if you know Python and Django. So that would be really helpful if someone could add um, so a way to look at that stuff. So what what one thing we're missing right now is a set of you know standardized or at least the beginning of standards on what is the way to reproduce a build. Like what is the environment or what is, where do we store the information? Because right now it's been ad hoc experiment and, uh, and so I can't say, well, yay, bonus point, your package is reproducible because I don't know what that means yet. We, we need to decide on something here. Or just you know, get, get to some code that will decide, but at least does nothing currently. I would love to have uh, something like an infrastructure like, like ci.debian.net that would actually be uh, just you know, reproduce, trying to reproduce packages. But we're not that yet. We're missing a few steps. Any other question? Is this, is this crazy? Is this a waste of time? Huh. Okay, troll, troll me. Okay, so this is kind of an insane idea uh, for the future, but like you were talking just now about having something like CI to W.net. It would be cool if we could put that in like an AMI or something so we could have this like distributed trust so that anyone who wanted to could, that's like an Amazon machine image. Huh. So uh, anyone who wanted to could like run some sort of continuous integration thing and you'd get like if the if the Debian infrastructure got pwned then someone else would catch it. Then you only have to have the AMI. Yeah. yeah. The, yeah. Or AMI. That's, uh, that's rough. We have so, only one so in this left. we need reproducible AMIs. <laughs> <laughs> well that's another project uh, Paul started which is called distri like reproducible installs. Look at the wiki page. There was Russ and that build last question. So on the comment of being able to reproduce this, uh, I think that if we're going to talk about having developers upload reproducible builds that we can verify then in the reproducible build environment, that really means that we need to be able to document exactly how you set the whole thing up to generate a build of this type, which means you get essentially that for free. And I think that we, it's probably better to have the detailed documentation and the specific set of tools than it is to have it at all as a machine image anyway, because that way you can verify each step of that. And given that one of the goals here is security verification, that gets more trust in the entire process. And it also allows for the various variants and workflow, because different people like to use, you know, Cal Builder versus uh, LVM uh, partitions or S Build instead of P Builder or all that kind of thing. Well, my, my, I mean, my goal would be like, you do, it's in GPKG and you do GPKG build package minus minus rebuild, give it a change file, boom. And you, and you can do that on any Debian system. That would be the best user experience on reproducing builds that I would love to get. Um, we'll see how, how far. Uh, I think we're at that time. Uh, so I will thank everybody who came and, and who's supportive of that thing. Come to the bar if you want to do shit. Thank you. Yeah.